another Irish skeptic, George Bernard Shaw, said, all change, all change comes through the power of unreasonable people. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable persists in adapting the world to himself. You may not know it, but that's what you're doing. You're trying to create an own universe for yourself in which you can be comfortable, where you can determine your own life, where you can make enough money to do what you want to do. Because you don't want necessarily to be working for the banks or the this or the that. No, you want to do your own thing. You are unreasonable by definition. And all change comes through the power of this unreason. First, you change your own life. And then others are changed. Gandhi, my great hero, said, first, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. Then you win. That's absolutely true, as, except as my friend says, in your case, Geldof, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you. The end. <laughs> so it's odd. I'm not trying to tailor my experience to this room. The truth is, the global economic crisis was caused by property. The stabilization of the crash was caused by poor people needing property in China. And four days ago, I was in Berlin. Now, I was talking to Mark on the phone before I did this, and we just got into a general conversation. I said, why is there this casino idea of property in our country? Why, why, why does that happen? Why did we decide that housing would be the general path to growth in the economy and to individual wealth. What happened here that we look at a house not as a primary source of shelter, this primal need, we still do that. If somebody breaks into your house, we talk about being violated. We talk about feeling raped. We talk about it as the most intimate thing, this little rectangle of brick, which is the entire world reduced to a square space. Someone gets in there, they're getting into your head. I wrote a song once in the Boomtown Rats. I think the line is, home is where the head is. Home is where the demons all come out to play. Home is where you hide yourself at night. Home is where you feel safe. And I wrote it in the wake of being burgled in the first house I ever bought, which was in Clapham. And it was a terrace, small terraced house, but I was so young, I guess, I had money enough, I was a pop star. 18 months before, I was on the dole queue in Dunleary in South Dublin. I had my own house, it was inconceivable. But I was on top of the pops and so the yahoos and the estates nearby targeted us and myself and Paula spent most of our time repelling borders at eight in the evening. But. I wrote that song in the middle of that, and I said, someone broke into this house last night. It's strange they didn't take a thing, because they didn't. They just broke in. And then the next line, I said, someone broke into his house last night. It's strange, but it feels like they took everything. So this space that we call property is sacred to the individual. This is where all human dramas played out, the hatred, the love, the reproduction, the memories. When people fuck with that, they mess with us. So when you guys buy our properties and you rent them out, someone isn't buying a brick. They're buying some space in which all of their life will be contained. There's a great responsibility in that. This game you're in has great responsibilities to the economy, to society, to the individuals. 
Rob and Mark were saying that they've got properties up in Peterborough. I was asking about the people who are housed there, what they like. Do you ever have problem families? I was very surprised because for people who dress so badly, they were... <laughs> Have you seen those ridiculous cowboy boots? <laughs> Embarrassing. Uh, um, but then again, they do own property in Peterborough. Um, <laughs> and they were very kind about the people. They may not think so, but they were in no way superior. They had problems, and there was someone there who'd been homeless, who'd been in housing, council housing, who understood the problems and could take care of it. I told you that when I was a kid, around 15, 16, I started working with the homeless in Dublin. I did that because, like a lot of people, I was rubbish, useless at school. There was no one at home to make me do my homework. And so I just stopped going home. There was nobody at home. As I said, my mother was dead, my dad was away, so I just went into Dublin, into the centre of Dublin, most days after school. And I kind of did it because it was the mid-60s and I'd been listening to people you know about, um, Bob Dylan. I'd been reading um, John Steinbeck, Woody Guthrie, Studs Terkel, the kind of romance of poverty, except there is no romance in poverty. And I begun to hang with um, a crowd called the Simon Community, which sounds like a religious thing, but it wasn't. And they looked after the sort of hookers and the lonely and the homeless and the dispossessed men and women. And they do very simple things like we gather vegetables from the grocers at six o'clock. All of the stuff that hadn't sold, they'd give to us. And at about two in the morning, the bakers would begin baking the next day's bread and they'd bake extra loaves for us. And we gathered them up and we'd go to Smithfield Market in Dublin, build a fire make some soup with all this stuff, and all these people would gather round. And here were these books I'd been reading, almost romantically about America, these vivid names. But it was happening on my doorstep. These weren't the hookers of Hollywood imagination. These were pale, thin, 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 stick girls with rags for clothes beaten up by their pimps in one instance because one of them asked me could she have an orange squash. And the men had fallen out of their families, lost their jobs, got drunk. But what we would do is once we'd sat around the fire and they'd had their soup, we'd fill up our flasks and walk around Dublin. We all had a sort of route and um, one of the people I remember very well. At the time, I thought she was an old lady. I suppose now I'd recognize her as being in her 40s, but being homeless, she could have been any age. And she lived in the porch, the doorway of an okay house, nothing great. And I'd go there most evenings and she'd be there huddled up in her cardboard boxes and, you know, a bag lady in effect, a schizophrenic. She was highly literate. And um, I remember, I suppose, what she said to me because it was quite lyrical the way she spoke. It had rhythm in it. And I said to her once, Mary, look, you know, do you want to get a hand to try and get into a home or something like that? She said, no, no. She chose to live like this because... She never wanted to hear the slap of the electric bill on the whole tile floor. Stuck with me. And so we chatted and she stank. That didn't bother me. And I'd walk away and this teenage boy would be filled with this enraged passion as all teenagers are, thinking about the man who owned that house coming back of an evening, and here's this sentient, intelligent human being in his doorway, 
stepping over, slamming the door in her face. And this enraged me and, you know, I probably spouted some anarchist nonsense about all property is theft, etc. Later, of course, still thinking of this in my 20s, I understood that this man came home every evening, saw this woman, probably said, good evening, Mary, stepped over her and closed the door. Would I do that? And the answer was shocking to me. No, I wouldn't. This guy didn't get the police to clear her off his doorstep. He didn't think about the value of his property being diminished. He gave her the dignity of acknowledging a human being and he let her live in the place she chose to be. And that was her property. So when I pitched up in Peterborough on the night that Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, and fucking Peterborough was more extraordinary than landing on the moon, I'm gonna tell you that. <laughs> it was uh, no dogs, no blacks, no Irish. So I made a point of going to that house clearly Irish, this Italian answered the door. And uh, it was, I think, 30 bob in advance, uh, yeah, whatever. I gave it to him, and that's where I was with this stupid fat son picking his nose, looking at the television the whole night. I worked up in the pea canning factory, I worked on the night shifts. But before I got that job, I forgot to tell you, lads, I got a job wiring um, the new shopping centre in uh, Peterborough in 1969. I hadn't a fucking clue. I'd never changed a plug in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it took them two weeks to twig. I'd been there blasting away at the ceiling, sticking fluorescence in, pretending I could understand the diagrams. The, the place probably burnt down, but that's absolutely true. I came to London, and um, I heard, being Irish, through the grapevine, there was great work to be had on uh, building the M2325. So those of you who land at Gatwick now in the coming summer and you have to get onto the 25, that junction at Merstham is Geldof Interchange. <laughs> it is the place where most accidents occur, because <laughs> the camber is slightly off, but there you go. I slept in Gatwick Airport for three months. Um, what was Tom Hanks like? Uh, I was going to get a place, and I was in Godston looking at B&Bs, and I thought, no, fuck it, I'd sleep out here for free. Nobody noticed. Save the money. And I lived there for three months, so I'm just advising you now, it's great. <laughs> Mortgage your own place, buy somewhere in Peterborough, you know. I slept out there because it had bathrooms, it had showers, it had cafes, you know, you could find a spot where there were no flights and you could move around so they didn't catch you. After the summer, <coughs> I'd saved up and moved into town. And because of what I'd done in the Simon community, I lived on the street. I was homeless. But that sounds ridiculous because I could have gone back to Ireland, so I, didn't, I wasn't homeless. But again, I chose to do that. I didn't have a job, didn't want to spend money. But you're 18, whatever it was, 18, 17. Save up. Eventually, I started sleeping in a crypt in a church in Hoburn, which later became the Sex Pistols office. And there was a bunch of people there and um, this priest would give us a sponge thing to lie on. And uh, again, I liked the sense of community amongst these actual people who were homeless. I began selling hot dogs on those trolleys and got arrested by the police as much as I could because Vine Street Police Station was quite comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually I got to live in a squat in Tufnell Park. So I've been through it. The squat was cool. We didn't break in and occupy it. We were kind of welcomed by the landlord. He couldn't rent it. Uh, there was some problem with the title deeds. And uh, myself and two girls and a bunch of friends were in there. And uh, we were raided a lot by the police. Uh, they were looking for drugs. 
They didn't find them. Um, <laughs> they were excellent drugs, how dare you? <laughs> and I went back to Ireland and yada, 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 and I become a pop singer, and I get a house in Clapham, and I'm getting burgled, and I look for somewhere else, and I find this 12th century priory in Kent, still have it, it's still beautiful. 3p it cost me in 1983 or whatever. Then moved into Chelsea, because now I was getting rich. Then got divorced and was expelled to the divorce man's ghetto of Battersea. <laughs> I don't know why girls think that's hilarious. I mean, it's, the guys are going. <laughs> I live in Battersea, I love it. I've got a flat. I don't think I'd change, even if I could. And I'd watch the house market as much as anyone else. The point is that whatever I paid for the flat is worth three times what it was. Wow. Except, as you know, to buy a new place at the commensurate level of the flat, I'd have to spend that and more again. So the casino wheel turns. Germany, four days ago. Housing is flat. Just outside Berlin is Potsdam, which is like Richmond to London, extremely beautiful, fabulous housing. You can get a mega, mega place. I mean, absolutely beautiful. We're talking 12, 14 million here. Less than a million euros. Why? Because the Germans, 80%, 85% of Germans rent. Very few own their houses. It's not a casino property economy. Is that why they're growing at 3.5% and we're flatlining? It's one of the reasons. Because our economy is so dependent on the property market. Theirs has nothing to do with it. It's to do with manufacturing and export. Could we compete? Yeah, we could. Is our manufacturing service sufficient? Yes, it is. 13% of the economy. France is 12%. Is it at a scale and, a, and, a, a, and um, a quality equal to the Germans? Yes, it is, despite what people say. Our workers are just as skilled and just as qualified. They've got 80 million people in Germany, that's the difference, and vast space, and all of them rent. Why? Because the rents are capped by the government. Not something you want to hear. I doubt you'd be rushing over to Berlin tomorrow to buy that mega house. They're capped and people save their money to spend on other things. They're also able to pass on the flat to their children. So that's why the economy took a different route. It's also, though, why they didn't collapse. So you people are engaged in this entrepreneurial activity that is so central to the core, not just of the economy, but there for the country, but much more importantly, to the people who will live in those houses.